Welcome to Failed Utopia, the podcast about utopian ideas and paradise lost. We look at utopian concepts of the past, present, and future, as well as utopian communities and cults, which promise the world to eager followers, but inevitably fail when it all starts to unravel. Over 20 years ago, Dubai began constructing the world's largest artificial archipelago of islands, designed to be a lavish oasis for the super rich. Today, the islands stand mostly empty, and some are sinking back into the sea. But the developers and government of Dubai refuse to give up on the mind-boggling mega-project. Let me tell you about this astonishing feat of engineering, how it did work, kind of, but also hasn't panned out the way they hoped, and why they'll probably never let this one go, no matter how bad an idea it was. The United Arab Emirates, as we know, is a wealthy petrostate known for its luxury and excess, including the famous Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world at just over half a mile high. The Federation of Seven Emirates stretch along the coast of the Arabian Peninsula, and Dubai is the largest city in the Emirates, with a population of about three and a half million. Now, to a place with such a rich upper strata of residents and visitors, nothing is more valuable than property along the oceanfront. So faced with booming development and tourism in the early 2000s, Developers and the Dubai government were faced with a challenge, since pretty much the entire coastline had already been fully developed, but there was still enormous demand for oceanfront property. They came up with a plan to add more beachfront property by undertaking a colossal megaproject, constructing artificial islands off the coast of Dubai specifically for the purpose of urban development. But these were no regular, boring islands, no. When viewed from above, the islands would form the shape of palm trees, there were three of these, then a map of the world, and finally the universe, which was a series of islands surrounding the world and consisting of the sun, moon, solar system, Milky Way, and a far-off galaxy. And then, next to one of the Palm Islands, another set of islands, called the Dubai Waterfront, would form the shape of a star and crescent, which of course is an important Islamic symbol. So, not too ambitious. (laughs) An American company drew up the plans, and in 2001, Nikhil, a real estate development company owned by Dubai's government, began work on the first in the series of islands to be constructed, which would be the first of the three Palm Islands. This island is called the Palm Jumeirah. It's basically one big island with a trunk and several fronds coming off each side to form the shape of a palm tree. And then there's a long series of islands encircling the entire thing in a ring, serving as a breakwater to protect it from erosion and waves. I admit, it looks really cool. And when completed, it served its purpose, basically doubling the oceanfront capacity of Dubai. The island can accommodate up to 120,000 people and boasts luxury homes and hotels. The first residents moved in around 2006, but it's hard to say how many people actually live there. I've seen estimates ranging from 10,000 to 80,000. While the Palm Jumeirah was under construction, work began on some of the islands for the World Archipelago. In the mid-2000s, Dubai's oil wealth was unimaginable, and it seemed like demand for opulent property on its beaches was insatiable. But then, in 2008, a global financial crisis was hitting the world, especially real estate, and it turned out that Dubai was not immune to the international financial meltdown. Construction projects ground to a halt, demand plummeted, and the price of the land they'd been so desperate to build just a few years earlier fell rapidly. In fact, Dubai's property prices 
fell by half in a year's time. Construction on the second of the Palm Islands, Palm Jebel Ali, stopped. Investors had to be refunded by Nikhil, and the project has never resumed, even though much of the land reclamation for that island was actually already completed. The sandbars stretching miles out into the sea are just sitting empty. A very small part of the Dubai waterfront, the Star and Crescent that was meant to serve as the breakwater for Palm Jebel Ali, was constructed, but it too was halted and sits abandoned. In 2018, the CEO of Nikhil said that the Palm Jebel Ali was slated to be a long-term project and will be revisited in the future. As for the third of the Palm Islands, the Palm Dera, it met a slightly better fate. Construction halted after a small part of its land reclamation was completed, but Nikhil tried to rescue this island by changing tax. Instead of building out the rest of the island or abandoning it completely, they rebranded the land that was constructed before the financial meltdown, developed it into a shopping district, and renamed it simply Dara Islands. The land reclamation for the world had largely been completed before the financial crisis, and not only that, but many of the islands had already been sold. But as you can imagine, many of the high net worth individuals buying this type of property were facing challenges due to the financial meltdown. An Irish real estate tycoon who owned the Ireland island killed himself in 2009 over his financial troubles when the market plummeted. The owner of the England island went to jail that same year for bouncing 50 million pounds in checks. And for the other investors and developers, the middle of a global bank and real estate crisis just wasn't the right time to be developing their prestige properties in the Emirates. Nikhil was drowning in debt and reportedly had to be bailed out to the tune of $25 billion at the end of 2009. So the 300 islands making up the world mostly just sat there. Now, that might have been okay if everything could have been left on ice until the markets recovered, but time was not on the developer's side. It turned out a land reclamation project on this scale has some downsides, and they were starting to show. While the feat of engineering and construction undertaken to create the Palm Jumeirah and the world was astonishing and frankly impressive from one perspective, it radically changed the landscape of the coastal environment. The land reclamation was achieved by building with sand and rock on more sand. To build the artificial land and breakwaters, they blasted millions of tons of rock from the Emirates Hejar Mountains and dredged billions of cubic meters of sand from the bottom of the Persian Gulf. And if building with sand on top of loose sand sounds like a bad idea, it is. The main problem is liquefaction. When the ground shifts, it pushes water up and causes the ground above to sink. Basically, in an earthquake, the sand could lose its strength and cohesion. But the engineers working on this project were pretty smart, so they used a process to compact the sand under the site with a vibration method cleverly termed vibrocompaction. In theory, this would stabilize the sand enough to build on. But in 2011, the Telegraph published an expose on the World Archipelago claiming that the islands were in fact sinking. A British company brought a lawsuit against the developer, Nikhil, stating that they had evidence that sand was eroding away from the islands and the shallow channels between them were silting up. At that time, although 70% of the 300 islands had reportedly been sold, the only island that was considered inhabited was Greenland, and that was owned by the ruler of Dubai. It had a show home built on it and was basically just there to promote the project. The British company bringing the suit was called Penguin Marine, and they'd bought rights to provide boat transportation to the islands. Lawyers seeking to get them out of their contract called the project dead, while lawyers for Nikhil responded that the project was simply in a coma, 
and continued to insist that the project would be completed and that the islands were not sinking according to their own surveying. The tribunal hearing the case in the UAE found for Nikhil, forcing Penguin Marine to stay in their contract. I don't have the expertise to determine who had it right, but in 2009, NASA satellites showed the islands to be sinking by 5 millimeters per year, according to the New York Times. Nikhil responded to the satellite imagery by asserting that the image resolution was low and that if the islands were sinking at that rate, they would have found evidence, such as leaking or broken pipes, cracks in buildings, and broken windows, which they hadn't. Meanwhile, residents on Palm Jumeirah were finding problems with their supposed luxury homes. The developer had added units, greatly increasing the housing density on the island after launching the project. This led some investors who had purchased homes before they were built to complain that the end result was not what was promised, and they felt they were crowded and living on top of each other. Not exactly the opulent living arrangement they thought they were paying for. Then residents started complaining about the water quality in the channels between the palm fronds. While the breakwater surrounding the island was necessary to protect it from erosion and storms, it also blocked the natural currents and caused the water inside the breakwater to go stagnant. There are gaps in the breakwater, but even theoretically, they only allow the water to circulate completely every couple of weeks or so. There were also rising concerns about the environmental effects of the extensive dredging and restructuring of the shallow coastal area of the Gulf, which had been so radically altered. Environmentalists fear that what actually occurred was a destabilization of the whole coastal system and tides, leading to rapid erosion of the coastline, particularly areas that weren't previously prone to erosion before the currents changed to accommodate the new islands in their path. Also, the dredging and redistribution of sand turned the usually clear water of the Gulf silty, suffocating and burying coral reefs and oyster beds, and damaging many other local marine species. Fish that used to reproduce in the shallow coastal waters were also lost due to the disruption to their habitat, because their young weren't able to survive the construction and the altered environment, according to marine biologists. The World Wildlife Fund stated in 2006 that the UAE's human pressure on global ecosystems is the highest in the world. The country is five times more unsustainable than any other country. In spite of all this, the mega project continues. More of the islands of the world have been or are being developed, with hotels, resorts, beach clubs, and a few private residences. One huge development underway is the heart of Europe, which is basically a mini recreation of Europe, featuring some shocking displays of excess like an outdoor snow plaza with artificial snow on an artificial island in Dubai. Climate change? What's that? And speaking of climate change, another challenge to the artificial islands looms, sea level rise, The original engineers did think to consider the risks of climate change to a degree and design the islands to withstand some amount of sea level rise, but in most projected scenarios, this won't be enough. So it remains to be seen how resilient the already sinking islands can be in the coming warmer decades. But no matter the cost or the setbacks, it seems we'll be seeing more and more of these islands in Dubai's future. The ruler of Dubai understands that looking toward the future, the Emirates need to diversify away from just oil, and he spent his years in power helping transform the city of Dubai into the world's top luxury tourism destination. They won't stay on top without constantly pushing forward with new mega projects that keep pushing the boundaries. The only limit is how much appetite the world's ultra wealthy have for prestige projects going forward. Given the number of other mega projects currently underway around the world, like the line, which just broke ground in Saudi Arabia this past October, I don't see an end anytime soon.
If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to help other people find it. Tell your friends about it. And if you want to support the pod directly and help keep new episodes coming, you can donate to the show through the link at the bottom of the show notes. Connect and stay in the loop on the website, failedutopia.com or the Facebook page at Failed Utopia Pod. Failed Utopia episodes are written and produced by me, Anna Roberts. The burning palm tree painting featured on the cover is by artist Perry Vasquez. My intro music is by Elliot Middleton. See you next time.